Good morning. Uh, good morning. See, this is what I've reminded last time when I preached. I said, when a speaker or preacher stands here, it is important that church also gives joyful, energetic reactions so that it keeps us energetic. Because if the one who is giving a talk starts sleeping, naturally the crowd is going to sleep or the church is also going to doze off. There's another thing that I would like to add to that this morning. It is important when we are sitting in a church listening to a talk that we should be also in prayers for the one who is sharing from God's word because the one who shares God's word needs a lot of prayer. So I hope as we sit here listening to this talk, you would be praying for me and we would be listening to God's word together. Well, for those who don't know me, I am Satyajit and I am a part of this church and I host a better house group at my place. So, <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's a great thing to stand here this morning. We have been looking at uh, seven letters from Revelations. Yeah, thank you. And we started this series asking a very simple question. And we said whenever we read these letters, there's one question that we need to ask. And that question is, I know, what about us? Right? Yeah, what about us? We look at these letters. We, we see that God corrects them. Christ writes to them and tells them, okay, this is good, this is bad. And we feel good about it and saying, okay. But then that's the question we need to ask. Then we moved on to the letter of Ephesus, and I would call it Ephesian deficiency. Because when Christ writes a letter to them, there are so many good things in them. But then there is one thing that Christ tells them, that you have fallen or you have forgotten your first love. And I think what we did this morning and what we have been doing from the beginning of this year is something that Ephesus might have failed to do. We have been reminded time and again to read God's word and spend time connecting with people. And that's the first love that God or Christ was talking about when he wrote to the letter of Ephesus. Then we went to Smyrna and we spoke about Smyrnian assurance. And we, see, we saw that the church there was under persecution. And even to this church, Christ is not saying, okay, my child, I know you're suffering. But then Christ said to them, be faithful even till the point of death. And that's the thing that um, we need to learn from the church. This morning, I, we are taking a double step. We would be dealing with the church of Pergamum and church of Thyatira. Now, these two letters are quite similar um, in, in what these churches were doing. In fact, if we look at all the seven cities, Thyatira was the smallest city, but it got the biggest letter. Out of all seven letters, the, this uh, Thyatira got the biggest letter. Now, just to understand a bit background before uh, we start understanding what the Word of God says there. Now, we all, I keep repeating this every time I talk about this. We need to understand that all these seven cities were part of a region that was called as Asia Minor. In present day, it's Turkey. So, when you look at the map, you find all these seven cities uh, in Turkey. Few of these cities are still existing. Few of these cities, like, they, they have found some archaeological evidences, but then these all cities are part of Turkey. During the time when letters were written, this whole region was under Roman Empire. So Romans were ruling uh, over this region. Romans were, had a polytheistic religion. So they had gods for various reasons. They had God for crops, they had God for fertility, they had God for war, they had God for climate, they had God for health, and they had gods for various things. So any city that we, have, we are talking about or we have spoken about would always have more than one temple in that city. 
added to that, there was this practice that was introduced in Roman Empire that they should worship the emperor. So then, in addition to all these gods, there was this another temple of emperor. And every citizen should worship the emperor. And that's the rule. And we said last time, since Jews were had, Jews had a good relationship with them, they were exempted from it. But apart from that, everybody else was expected to worship the emperor. Now, they had no restrictions for people, those who were following the teachings of Christ, to follow, to meet. But then, these expectations in society made a situation a difficult one for them. Now, in this context, these churches are growing. And to these churches, Christ is writing letters. Now, letters that we are looking at can be found in Revelation chapter 2. And they're just one above the other, so we won't have to flip a lot of pages in our Bible this morning. Now, if we look at the introduction in this letter... All the previous introductions were a bit polite, with calm, was like soft on side. But then when he starts writing to the church of Pergamum, he says, these are the words of him who has sharp, double-edged sword. Now, it's a strong introduction. It's a warrior's introduction because I will not have a sw sharp sword with me, right? It would look so odd. But whenever we say this word, strong double-edged sword, we kind of imagine a warrior kind of person who is holding this sword. And when we talk about sword, we talk about an authority. Because either a soldier will have a sword, a warrior will have a sword, a king will have a sword. And they have that authority that comes with that. Interestingly, in this letter, there is another word that talks about king's authority or king's center. Now, if you look at verse 13, it says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Now, we need to understand. Christ is talking about someone who has a double-edged sword, and he is talking about that I know there is a throne. So, these are two elements that signifies a kingdom or signifies a king. Now, church, or sorry, a city of Pergamum had a big altar. Now, they had this practice in ancient cities where they would build altars for their God. Now, this city had made a big altar for king of gods, whose name was Zeus. And, and this looked just like a throne. Added to that, Pergamum was first city in the whole Asia Minor region to start worshipping the emperors. So there was this introduction of this practice and Pergamum established that practice in that region. So, so when Christ says that, I know there is Satan's throne in this city. He, now there is always, you know, when you interpret these books of New Testament, you cannot pinpoint exactly a precise thing what has been said, but then both these things exactly fit in what Christ wants to identify here. So you talk about emperor, you talk about his worship, you talk about his authority, but wait, I am the one who has a double-edged sword. I am the one who has authority. I am the one who can stand or who is not what they are, but I am more beyond that. Now, if you look at the letter of Thyatira in verse 18, he uses the word, these are the words of the Son of God. Now, this is a good title for us to read, Son of God, and we, we are so uh, thorough with this title that we use it again and again. But then, uh, this is interesting to know that this title, Son of God, is not something very unique to Christ. So this phrase, this title, Son of God, was a very 
common title that was used uh, during that time. Now, son of God was also a title which was given to the Caesars. Caesars were the emperors of the one who was ruling in Rome. So they were also called as son of God. So, and in Revelation, this is the only place where they have used this title, son of God. Otherwise, they have always used the term son of man. So, so when he says son of God, he is trying to convey, okay, emperor, son of God, and I am son of God. So he is trying to establish in both the letters that I stand in contrast to the authorities that you have in your cities, that you fear, that you worship. And so, so when we talk about this, both son of God, Christ goes ahead and says in verse 18 that whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Now this is what makes him unique. Now you have an emperor there who is called a son of God, but then he cannot see everything that's happening. He has to rely on people. He has to rely on his team to come and tell him what's happening in his, re uh, in, in his kingdom. But then I am son of God who has eyes uh, like a blazing fire. So I can see it all. I know what is happening around. So I am son of God and I know it all. Now, when he talks about bronze feet, now Thyatira was a big trade center. Though it was a small city, it was a big trade center. It was a basically a trade city. And they supplied metal in the whole region. So Thyatira, out of all the seven churches, would have been the best place to know what bronze is or what bronze signifies. Now, I, I might not be very good in all this technical stuff that I always say, but then uh, bronze was considered as one of the strongest metal available in those times. So when Christ says, my feet are like bronze, they knew that bronze cannot be broken easily. Bronze can crush anything and everything that comes uh, under it. So when Christ says that I, my feet are like a bronze, he is conveying your emperor sitting there in the palace would be restricted by opposition, but I will not be restricted in any way. So I can see all, I can move, I will progress and I will go on and there is nothing that can hinder my progress. And this is the contrast that Christ is trying to create. Christ is trying to show to both these churches of Pergamum and Thyatira. Friends, these churches had forgotten one important fact about their God. One important fact about the God. And the fact was, He is over all. He is in control. He is an authority over our lives. You know, when we look at these churches, they were in need of that reminder. Because for them, they easily surrendered to these authorities. Now, I want you to think about this. Now, we had a great morning. We, we had a nice worship this morning and I felt like if I can take an excuse of not preaching because we could just continue it. It was a great. But in this, from this morning, we have been focusing on greatness of God. And many times we forget this fact in our lives that God is in control of everything and that is in existence that is outside and that is within me you know try explaining a child how hard works you'll have to go back and learn your own basics you know if you have a child like Salome if seven years when they grow up she comes up with a lot of questions 
But then think, this is, this is a very interesting thing in our life. We sit here and our whole body is still functioning. We are not doing anything about, for that. Even, even, we know, even when we know that God is in control, even when we know God has authority, even when we know that he had our thought above everything else in this world, Even when we sing the songs, our God is an awesome God, and when we sing how great is thy faithfulness, and everything that we sing, when we see situations in our life, we forget this important truth in our life. You know, it's, it's like a Peter's story. He was doing the most impossible feat anyone could have ever done in the history of humans. He was walking on water. And Christ said, walk on water. So we, I, I try to imagine that and I think how difficult it must have been for him to step out of a boat. But then he said, okay, Christ is calling me, let me do it. So he stepped out, he started walking and then in between he looked at things around him and that distracted him. And that is a similar thing that happens to us in our life. We know who our God is. We know what his authority is. We know that he is a creator of all things. We know that he holds everything under his control. And yet when we face situations in our life, we easily give up looking at him and we start panicking and we start looking here and there and we forget that he is in control of our lives. You know, I, I always say this. Whenever we face any situations in our life, you know what we do? Or most of us, we try to list, make a list of things that we can do to face the situation. We then make a list of friends, we then make, uh, make a list of families, then we look at different sources and all that stuff and all that stuff. And when everything runs out, then we say, oh God, now you help me. That is what we do. But whereas when we come to church each Sunday, we say, oh God, how great is thou art. And Lord, we know that you're awesome. Lord, we know that you're wonderful. Lord, we know you're powerful. But then when we go out of church, when we face situations like Peter, we just get our attention from God and drown. But we are supposed to be focused on him, knowing that he is in control, knowing that yes, in him I can do all things. And that is what these churches in Pergamum and Thyatira were not doing. Now, interestingly, when we look at these two churches, they are appreciated for their faith. You know, both these churches are appreciated for their faith. And in fact, to the church of Thyatira, he says, you know, there's, there's a list in verse 19. He says, I know your deeds, and then there's a comma, and that says, your deeds, your love, and your faith, and then there's comma, and then your service, and your and perseverance. And not only that, then he goes on to next step and says, that you are now doing more than you did at first. Well, that's a good church, right? So many things they are doing, right? And then you would say, wow, that's a good thing. You know, if, if someone writes a letter to us today like that and we would say, wow. And then we would expect, we would not expect any corrections there. You know, if we look at uh, this couplet there, it says, your love and faith. So, out of love, there is a service and out of faith, there is a perseverance. And this church was good. Even church of Pergamum was appreciated for faith they had. And most of the time, when we look at ourselves, we look at things in our life and, I say, and we conclude it, saying, okay, this is good, this is good. See, I go to church, I read Bible, I pray every day, I'm in strong relationship with Christ, uh, with Christ and when we, when we talk with people, we talk about our wonderful experiences that we had with Christ, and we think, wow, I'm doing great. But then I like this part, because Christ goes a step beyond what is actually in the church. And I, and, and I just, when I was writing my notes and I said, 
Christ went and became a bit pessimist like me. Because I, I tend to do that and you talk to Sheba and she'll tell you about this. <laughs> but then you know, these churches, when Christ talks to them, he goes a step beyond and talks about things that they need to still correct. Now, let me get this fact straight. Christ is not a strict dictator in our life. He is, he is not giving us a step-by-step -step guide that you must do it. But the only reason Christ is still correcting this church is because Christ wants us to be a part of his kingdom. Because Christ wants us to make ourselves in a way where we would be eligible or we would be in a right position would be a right term to be a part of his kingdom. So when he corrects us, even when we are growing in our faith, we need to make sure that we look into our lives and see which area do I still need to correct. Because most of the time we think, I'm f completely fine. See, I have my own list. I have my checklist. I do everything according to that checklist. And I think I'm doing great. And most of the church of Thyatira and Pergamum also thought that. See, we are doing good enough faith. We are serving one another. We are growing strong. We are, we are doing what we, we were doing. Uh, you know, when we started, we are doing much better things now. But then, that was not all for God. You know, we, we, we have this uh, interesting discussions in a house group, a better one. <laughs> so, we, we, ha we were having this discussion about correcting one another. And, and we often conclude saying that it depends from whom that correction comes. Which is the right thing. And sometimes people might be very lovingly and in, in, in very nice words, comforting words, they might correct someone. Sometimes people might be harsh in correcting us. And most of the time, rather than taking those corrections, we tend to ignore it. And we think, okay, I know what I'm doing. But my friends, God wants us to grow. God wants us to correct in the areas that we are ignoring. In the areas that we think, okay, that's fine for me. I'm doing this. You know, this was the problem in these churches of Pergamum and Thyatira. Now, interestingly, both these churches talk about two Old Testament characters. Church of Pergamum has a mention of Balaam and Thyatira talks about Jezebel. Who was Balaam? Don't tell me what is written in the passage. Who was Balaam? What is, what is the most significant thing of this prophet? Sorry? He, he tried to curse the Israelites and God told him not to. Yes, he, he tried to curse the Israelites and then he couldn't curse the Israelites and he, every time he went, instead of cursing these Israelites, he ended up blessing them more. And he was so blinded by money that his donkey spoke and he told him, if I wouldn't have stopped, Angel would have killed you. So, so Balaam's donkey spoke. So you know, donkeys can speak in Bible. And his donkey spoke. So, Balaam tried to curse the people of Israel because this king of Moab, Balak, hired him saying, okay, I'll give you a lot of money. You curse these people from me so that they can be defeated. Seven times he tried. He could not do it. But then he wanted money. He said, see, I cannot curse these people. I'm not able to curse these people. But you do one thing. You move their attention from away from God. And then he gave him an idea. He says, you, you do this. You send your women to them. So then they will divert their attention. Now, in fact, uh, since I was more focused on the topic of compromise, both of these churches talks about sexual immorality. 
And it's, it's a huge topic that every church needs to talk about. And I'm, I'm, I'm not dealing with that today, but maybe in future we'll do that. But then this prophet knew that, okay, that can be the way where they will start moving their attention from God. Now, Jezebel, in uh, the letter of Thyatira, in fact, Jezebel was known as a very wicked character in Old Testament. Again, who was Jezebel? She was married to Ahab, okay. Sorry? She was a prophetess of Baal, okay, we can say that. But she was a, she, she was a worshiper of Baal, and she hired prophets to give a challenge to Elijah. Do you remember the great challenge on the Mount Carmel, I suppose? I'm not sure of the mountain. Mount Carmel, right? And there was a great challenge. You know, we have all these challenges on uh, Instagram these days, whatnot, I don't know. But then they had this a sacrifice challenge. Who's got the real sacrifice challenge? And then they challenged Elijah, and then Elijah's God proved to be a stronger God than the Baal God, so uh, she ordered them to kill. But then she is a very wicked lady who caused Israelites to move away from God. So when this word Jezebel is used, it is not actually uh, the actual name of a person, but it describes about a wickedness of someone within the church who caused people of God to move away from his own words. But my focus this morning is not about Balaam or not about this Jezebel who was present in the church, but my focus this morning is about these churches who so easily and willingly were ready to compromise from their ways that God had told them. Now, always remember when we, when we are talking about this church, these churches were strong in faith. They are appreciated for that. These churches were doing good in their love. Christ appreciates from them for that. But then on the other side, they had started compromising things. Now, in Pergamum, it says you have those who gave themselves to the teaching of Balaam. And we start compromising things. And that is a, a big thing in our spiritual walk with the Lord. And we have become so much more comfortable in compromising that we try to come up with a very strong, nice worded justification for everything that we do and say, oh, that's, that's okay. You know, for this church of Thyatira, when it talks about eating a food that is sacrificed to idols, that was something they had to do if they had to survive in that city. Now we need to understand. So sometimes when we make few excuses for some basic needs in our life, Thyatira, the church of Thyatira was struggling for their, their basic need. And if they avoided doing that, they had no chance to get any work in the city. Now, as I said, this city was a trade city, so they had guilds. And every guild has a temple. So this temple, every once in a month, they had a practice of offering food to that god and then eating that food. That was a reason, basically, to show that we are one community as a traders, and also it says that it was to make sure that they are in touch with one another. So if Church of Thyatira would have avoided that, if Church of Thyatira would have said, okay, we are Christians, we follow Christ, and we are not supposed to eat that food, so let me not do it. No. It would have made them 
in a very bad place in a society. Now, I'm sorry. Now, I understand that we all come from different parts of the world. I come from India and I understand this concept very well. And we always face this question whenever there are festivals that are happening around and we get invitations from people. So what do we do? We go. We don't go. We eat food. We don't eat food. We take prasada. We don't take prasada. Yes. Prasada. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I forgot that. <laughs> now, I, I feel so much at home now, I forgot that I'm not in India. <laughs> okay, so when I say prasada, prasada is a food that is made just as a sacrifice to God. And then once it is sacrificed or offered to God, they give that as a blessing to everyone, those who come uh, to see the God. So that's, that's prasada. Uh, uh, a general God, not G, a small G God, yeah, not a big G God. Yes. No, 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 it's fine. That's great. That that's an important feeling there. So, this city of Thyatira had to take part in that in order to survive. Even when they got involved in that, even when Christ was aware of this fact, even then Christ tells them. You have done wrong. Because we compromise with things make, to just to make sure we get our basics, basic needs met. We compromise with so many things. We, we compromise at our workplace. We compromise at shops and what, what, what not. Now this is an important part for us to understand. We struggle we compromise just to make sure that we are able to go through. You know, uh, that's a box. And compromise is broken in two words. One word, two words, now it's thing. But then the only thought of making this box is we compromise just to fit ourselves into that rectangle. Just to fit ourselves into the society. Just to fit ourselves into our workplaces. Just to fit ourselves into our friend circle. Just to fit ourselves into people that we see every day. And we think, that's fine. See, I go to church every day. Oh, sorry, every Sunday. I read Bible every Sunday. I, I pray to God. I, I, I go for evangelical works. I, I love people, you know. I do 110 things for him. So, that part is okay. We need to understand that God is not just okay with our faith in him. God is not just okay with the love that we have for others and when we serve others. But Christ expects us to dedicate ourselves completely to him. You know, I read it somewhere and um, yeah. It says, it is important to understand for us that Christian life is not a battle. Battles can be fought within a week, a month or so, and then it's over. But Christian life is a campaign that goes on and on and on every day. Now, in, now this can be a difficult question, and I, I really don't expect many to speak, but then if it speak, it's good for us. In what way? Do you think we end up compromising in our lives every day? A few examples, maybe not yours. Even if you say, we'll, we'll say it's not yours, so that's fine. So we'll not blame you for that. Okay, this morning, um, I got a phone call at 6 o'clock in the morning from somebody that was meant to come at 1, one o'clock this afternoon um, to take away some um, furniture from the garage. And he rang at 6 o'clock in the morning and said, I'm outside your house. I want to collect the stuff now. And I felt all this anger. And, but then I thought, and I said, no. We arranged for one o'clock, and you can't ring me at six o'clock in the morning outside my house, expect me to get up and go. And that's an area in the past I would have compromised 
and would have just got up. And I would have been upset about it, but I would have just caved in and done that. So when you were talking, that came to my mind. So, um, yeah. So we compromise. Anything else? Any other ways we compromise? It's not you. We'll, we'll just say that it's not you. I think it's very easy to get drawn into gossip. So, um, you know, somebody will tell you something and it, it just starts as a, a normal conversation, especially at work, and then other people will speak and then, you know, it tends to build and there's more of a conversation going on. And it's just, it's really easy to get into. It's easy to talk about someone. You know, you add A, then you add B, and then you add C, and then you talk about a lot more things about people. Um, for me, an um, uh, area that I struggle with, that I, uh, you know, battle with a lot, I'm, I mix with quite a lot of people from, with different backgrounds, different religions, and, you know, their thing, just in general conversation, I mean, I'm not just, like, having these heavy spiritual conversations, but they might, if it touches on anything like that, they might sort of say like, oh, like, you know, oh, it's, um, oh, all religions are the same. So, you know, when you're just in just a general sort of light-hearted social situation, it's difficult to find the right things to say with, without compromising. So, yeah, that is quite difficult and I try not to, but uh, sometimes how the conversation has gone where do you err on the side of like offending that person or you know sort of fudging it sort of a little bit of a compromise <laughs> yeah. so so we struggle to give our right views and then say we say okay i don't want to offend somebody so let me just say it we live in a society where society is accepting anything and everything that can be seen around and since it becomes a part of a society, and we be, being a part of a society as a church, as a community, we, need, or we are forced to accept those things. You know, if, if you read church history, you now this is something I, I would really want to happen. If you read church history, it says that church were the influence centers. So everything that was happening in the church influenced the society. And that's how society grew. And that's where society got their moral values and all that stuff. But now, we are on the other side of a story. We are becoming the part of influences that are made in society. Why? Because we started compromising. We should be influencers, but we are being influenced by society now. Church of Thyatira, church at Pergamum, should have been an influence centers. But they were forced to compromise because they forgot that my God is a God who is in control. So then, let, let me just question, oh, uh, let me just end with the last question. So what do we do when we find a situation when we are forced to compromise? Because we all compromise. No, I mean, I think this would be something, one thing that no one can say, I, can, I never compromise. As someone who is giving a talk this morning, yes, I do compromise. But then what do we do when we face situations like this? Just go ahead and say, that's fine. I go to church. I read Bible. I pray. I serve. And that's what Church of Thyatira was doing. I think it is important. Many times I see people arguing about why should I go to church? You know, I can read Bible at home. You know, I can hear a good sermon on YouTube according to my own preferences. So many sermons there. And that's so easy. Yeah. And then I can listen to a few songs which I like. Then I can hear a sermon and that can be a good Sunday worship for me. But then Christian life is a community life. 
Christian life is growing together. So if you want to stand strong in our faith, it is important that we grow in God's word. We grow in this word alone each morning as we have been reminded and we grow in this together. You know, I, I, I used to make my church sing this song again and again. Read your Bible, pray every day. It will make you grow. I don't know if you sing that song here. I'll try to sing. Okay, don't laugh. <laughs> Read your Bible, pray every day. Pray every day. Pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day. It will make you grow. It will make you grow. It will make you grow. Read your Bible, pray every day. It will make you grow. Friends, if you want... I sing well, right? Yeah. yeah. But then better than that is if we read Bible, if we pray every day, if we grow in our love with one another, if we continue to be strong in our fellowship, we will get stronger to face situations where we tend to compromise easily. We would be in a better position to handle because Spirit of God would be there to lead us, guide us, and tell us what should we be doing. So instead of being distracted by winds, that distracted Peter's attention. We would be focused on God and doing what we are supposed to do. Friends, at this time, I, I really want church to stand. If you can. And as, as we have spent a lot of time this morning in prayers. Let us try to narrow down to areas that we think that we willingly compromise. We willingly give in just to fit into that box, just to fit into the society, just to fit into our workplace, just to fit into our friends and all other areas. Let this be a time where we focus our attention to God. And let's pray to God this morning. God, help us not to be distracted. Help us not to compromise and focus on the fact that you are in control of our lives. That you are in control of everything. As Koya comes up and sings the next song, let's be in prayer. Let's ask God, God, you help me to dedicate myself to you. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.